Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the follow-up to the Q&A sessions. Today is the 9th of April, Thursday the 9th. We usually do this webinar on a Friday, but tomorrow is bank holiday. So just uh, introducing myself, Mita Sani, and Tosh Pulpetier. Hi, Tosh. Hi there. Hi there. We just literally did the uh, live Q&A this afternoon at 1 o'clock. So what we've been doing for people to make sure that all of their questions are answered is we're literally going to go through the chat um, chat box and answer each and every single question that was covered within that session or wasn't covered, just so there's absolute clarity, uh, particularly people that were looking for um, you know specific answers to those questions. But also, if you've got any questions anyway, just reach out to us. Our contact details are there, our emails, our telephone numbers. You know, if we don't know what to do in this uh, client, this climate, we'll know somebody that can help. So uh, please do we should get in touch with us, whatever the query, and just see, you know, use the expert advice and help that's available. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everyone who participated in the event today made it really, really relevant and useful. So thank you all for your questions. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to be moving into starting those questions. Tosh, are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Let's dive in. So something I did notice, Tosh, was that um, there were some questions that we were still trying to get the clarity on. So I know that we've spent a few minutes going and looking at uh, statutory information, legislation, updates. And uh, I wanted to start just by walking through. Now, we, if we've covered some of these already, I won't, we won't go uh, into too much detail. But um, the first question, actually, I know you and I did want to go up, uh, back and look at. And that was from Eric, who asked, I thought it was possible to claim employers NI contributions based on the 2500 in addition to the 2500. So what's the what is the actual position on that? Because I thought you couldn't, but I think you've got uh, an update. Yeah, well, so, so I mean, Eric, Eric asked the question and then he made me kind of doubt myself, which is I said I'll, I'll double check it because even I was thinking, wasn't that inclusive? So I went straight to the government site. Uh, you can't see it here. I'm not going to screen share it. Uh, the government's uh, guidance, which is about claiming for wage costs through the coronavirus job retention scheme. And this is what it says word for word. Okay, thank it you. says uh, that if you can, uh, by the way, the, the uh, HR online portal is going to be up and running from the 20th of April. So we'll have a much clearer guidance of specifically what is or isn't needed. But anyway, it says this on the government says, uh, website. OK, uh, if you cannot maintain your current workforce because your operations have been severely affected by the coronavirus, you can furlough employees and apply for a grant that covers 80 percent of their usual monthly wage costs up to two thousand five hundred pounds. We know that already. Plus the associated employer national insurance contributions and minimum automatic enrollment uh, employer pension contributions on that wage. Okay, so what that basically great. means is it's on top of. So so people should be getting the two and a half thousand pounds. That's great news. That is really great news because- oh, I'm assuming that their limit is, is beyond that. Yeah, it's 80%, is it two and a half max? Two and a half is the max, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, Vivian also asked whether that was taxable and it is taxable. So we-, we, right. we know that. But it's kind of taxed at source. Because it's already been paid, and then it's just a matter of being reclaimed, right? By by the organisation. By yeah. the organisation and passed on to the employee. Yeah, unless it's already been paid. Correct, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct, <laughs> exactly right. If it's been paid already, it's a reimbursement to the employer. If it's not been paid already, it's money being claimed that then has to be passed on to the employee. Perfect, thank you. Um, now, the next question we had around furloughing was uh, about staff that had been furloughed uh, but okay I'm going to read it out it's from Simon if I have furloughed staff and someone wants to work for someone else in that period what restrictions are there around when they can work um, now you again did give us some clarity on that is there anything you want to add it was no, it's brand new it really came up this last couple of days yeah. um, and the situation weirdly for me employment lawyer is the employee can work for another employer whilst they're furloughed so that in essence can mean that they can earn up to 180 percent of their salary 80 percent through the furlough scheme and then 100 percent from the new job right um so there's nothing stopping them uh, from working during normal contracted uh, um, working hours whilst they're furloughed as long as it is with the employer's agreement if the employer does not agree that then they can't do that i guess the question would be well, if there's no work to do, why wouldn't they agree that? 
I suppose the answer to that might be that if they're doing some sort of furlough rotation after every three weeks, because that's the minimum period that the furlough agreement could be in place for, well, then that other employee has to be available, presumably, yeah. during that time. So as long as there's clarity on the, the circumstances, the terms that's been permitted, there's nothing stopping an employer working somewhere else whilst they're on furlough leave. Thank you, Josh. So just, just give us some more insight into what you mean by rotation, because that's not a term I've used. I might be thinking about something similar, but just, just clarify what you mean by that three-week rotation. Well, it's kind of understandable, isn't it, where there are employees that are working and maybe they're getting 100% of their pay, and there's other employees that are not working and they're getting 80% of their pay. Yeah. So it makes sense that you're able to swap them around, perhaps, if that's an option for the company, the skill sets and stuff like that. But the furlough agreement or the furlough period has to be for a minimum of three weeks. So you, that means you can rotate every three weeks that one employee is furloughed and another one's working, and then you swap them over. Now, you need to have the documentation in place to show those furlough periods, whether it's a separate furlough agreement or whatever it is you're going to have to demonstrate to the HMRC, because yeah. when we're coming to investigating all of this at the end of this whole process, at the moment they're just dishing out lots of money to people, right? The, 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 the portal's gonna be up on the 20th of April, the first payments are going to be made by the 30th of April. And thereafter, yeah. what they're saying is, that depending on the submission of the papers through the portal or information through the portal, uh, that they're looking for a, a payback period of time, four to six working days. Um, so, so it's going to be quite a quick turnaround for, for people wanting to make those things. So you just need to, to, to look at what the portal says and provide the information that is needed to be able to claim it properly, right? Yeah. Thank you. Right. So we have a question from Posh asking about how we calculate the 80 percent on a salary of twenty nine thousand uh, for a casual employee. Now, I mean, the term casual is quite a broad range of, of connotations, isn't it? I mean, what would you take as casual? Sort no, of I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look at that even meter. What okay. I would look at is what is the criteria to be a furloughed employee? Yeah, well, they have to be on the PAYE. If on the PAYE, PAYE is a zero, casual, whatever you want to call it, yeah. it still applies. And then yeah. it's only a matter of calculating how, what is a month's pay for them. And what they're saying is where it's variable, which I presume what the casual arrangement might be, if they're on the PAYE system, yeah. is it will be calculated on, on the earnings over the last 12 months divided by 12. Or yeah. if, it's, you know, if it's variable, what you can do is you can look at what that person was earning at the same time last year. And what if they've only done a month with the organization so far? Well, the guidance is saying is you want to have a year's worth of credentials. If you haven't, you're going to give whatever credentials you've got. Okay. Obviously, the idea is that they're on the PAYE from the 28th of February onwards. Um, and, and so, you know, there may be some people that's just started a few weeks or a few months and they'll still be entitled to it, but they'll base it on the information that's available. So a lot of clients are asking us because we obviously provide temporary and contractual uh, people out to organizations. They're asking yeah. us where they had a temp or, and even temps are calling us and asking where they were working on the project of February, but it was only for a week. Can they now be furloughed? Because some, some were working, some weren't, some were just on our PAYE. Do those temps qualify as well then? If they are on the payroll as of yeah. 28th of February, yes. Absolutely. Fine. Well, there's been there one day or a thousand days or wow. anything more Fine. or anything in between. And it doesn't matter how long the booking might have been or anything like that. The booking. So, for example, if a, co a contract was for a three month booking, three month contract, or it was a two week. Well, if there's some other factors uh, that will override the reason for the contract to come to an end, well, that might be different. Yeah. So, but at the moment, what it's saying is you just have to be in the PAYE for that for that purpose, right? It, yeah. it isn't even necessarily, it was originally intended as an alternative to redundancies or layoffs. Now it's anyone who can't work. So technically speaking, if an employee resigned and their effective res resignation date was the 1st of March, say, so they were on the payroll, well, what the employer has a choice of doing with that employee is retracting that, putting them back on the books, yeah. and then them being furloughed. Yeah. I guess the question would just be, why would you do that? Yeah, and, and all organisations would need to be able to justify why they furloughed somebody and for what period of time. I mean, at the moment, it's only available for the end of April, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So so it will be, when it's asked for, when they investigate it, they will ask for evidence to show that there was no work available, which is the same way as any kind of redundancy scenario, right? They'll yeah. look at companies' accounts. They'll look at your inbox. They'll look at telephone records. Depends on how, how, 
how deep they want to dive, I suppose. Yeah. Right, good. Let's move on to the second page. And we have a we have some questions here. I think we did answer Louise's, we did answer Louise's question about enhancing furlough pay. So they said that they're enhancing furlough to a hundred percent. Some people actually do have contracts that are due to end this week. They want to help them out and extend them and put them on furlough, but not enhance that pay. Could that be a discrimination claim? So we've just covered, no, covered that. No. So, yeah, so discrimination has to be unlawful discrimination. And there are only nine protected characteristics. And it means things like race, sex, religion, disability, age, sexual orientation, those sorts of things, right? Yeah. So if I, if I discriminate against you, Mita, let's say because you're a smoker, or a drinker, well, that's not <laughs> yeah. a prohibited, I'm, I'm not, stop, don't tell my mother. Uh, the, the, it, it, that's not, it's not unlawful. So I can discriminate against you because of that, but that isn't a protected characteristic. Yeah. If you are picking and choosing furloughs based on things that are protected characteristics, Fine. like I said, age, sex, religion, disability, marital status, all those sorts of things, yeah. well, then you're going to expose yourself to a discrimination claim. Otherwise, you can do what you like. Fine. Good. Go ahead. There's also ordinary unfair dismissal principles, right? So if you're going to get rid of somebody and not furlough them or consider that person should be or shouldn't be, then you could be exposed to it if they've got more than to a claim for unfair dismissal if they've got more than two years. So just be clear on why you're doing what you're doing and why you're doing it and yeah. document it in case you have to have to justify yourself as to a court. And how would or, uh, MRC respond to, I mean, I know this is a bit of an unknown yet, but if they're rehiring people that there wasn't work for, is that a bit of a grey area there? Do they have to be careful about that? Well, what are you saying? The, the, the law allows them to do it. Right. The issue is purely that they are on the payroll from the 28th of Feb, right? So the termination date comes afterwards, and it's because it was a redundancy, or actually even if it's a resignation. Yeah. It just means that there's, there's not, no work for them to do. They're allowed to rehire them. Back on the books, and you can furlough them. That is what, it, that oh. is what the guidance clearly says. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Let's look at this. So... This follows on from that, where it says uh, the employee letter says that the individual has been furloughed from the 1st of March. That ends on the 30th of April. Can we then ask the employee to come and work for the employer again? So, yeah. That or, or, or in, in any other circumstances that you would ask them to come back to work in as well? Yes, absolutely. And it could be. If, if, if the virus continues and they're not able to come back out and they're off because of sick leave, all those things, all those same things apply. So we're literally going a bit day by day, week by week, aren't we? We haven't even gone past the peak of it yet. Yeah. And if, if an employee has a letter that furloughs them for two months, but the employer says, right, actually, I need you back after three weeks, the employee is then obliged to get back to work. Well, you couldn't bring the furlough agreement to an end when there's work for them to do. By definition, it has to be the case. And that doesn't have to be by mutual agreement. No, the mutual right. agreement is to go on furlough. But obviously, if you're bringing them back to work, it's full pay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Right. We talked a bit about zero hour workers. That is very much the same as, as an, any employee. And you talked about the period of time that we would look at for calculating the salary. Um, yes. Have a look. Uh, here we go. So this is, again, clarifying a point here. If an employee was not with us at the date of furlough, I think they mean the 28th of February, they started a week later there is no work for them. What can I do with them? That's from Vivian. You can terminate their employment with notice pay. Uh, if, if it's that long, I don't, you know, depending on what the contract says, it may mean no notice pay. Um, and they're not entitled to redundancy because it's less than two years. So the choices are yours, to be honest. You to keep that going, but they're not entitled to be furloughed. Got it. Thank you. Right, let's have a look. We, we covered Deborah's question about the employee working just one hour. We recommended that if you have got people that are just doing an hour, that maybe that should then be allocated over to another member of the team. Uh, we distribute the duties because yeah. you're, if an employee is ready, willing and able to work, they're entitled to be paid for it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. even in any ordinary period of time, an employer could just do whatever they want whenever they feel like it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. We then have a question from Gillian around directors, and we did answer this in the session. But just to summarise, at the moment, there is no support for directors around dividends. Directors can furlough themselves, 
that would only be for the salary element. So if you're only paying yourself £917, the maximum you could furlough yourself for would be 80% of that. So at the moment, that is it. Although I've heard about directors, um, you, you know, it, it's a good question to ask your accountant is what I'd say, because they could find ways to support you that may not be government led, but, but you know, could be sort of looking at your accounting in a different way, tools that accountants have, but it's definitely a good question to ask your accountant. This is what I think you should know about if you're a director, okay? okay. Uh, number one is, because you're still, uh, if you're not working at all, like any other employee, and you're a director, you can be furloughed quite simply like anybody else, right? Yeah. But presumably there's at least one director or one partner in the firm uh, that is uh, having to carry on running the ship. So what, the, what they're saying is you can still furlough all directors. So in that last director, as long as the last director is only performing their statutory duties, whatever that means. Uh, but it effectively means like attending the AGM, uh, maybe admin duties and so forth. So if they are doing just those things, they'll still be furloughed. Okay. If they are doing other things that is either work generating generation work for the work uh, for the uh, workplace sorry um you know income uh, generation or if it's anything that is work related so forth but i'm just keeping it ticking along well then it won't be further because you're doing work so it makes sense that rather than giving a person an hour here or there you furlough them and maybe pass those minor duties elsewhere where it can be delegated to somebody that's not furloughed then of course you can always do the the, the rotation every three months uh, every three weeks sorry three weeks so that's yeah. the first thing it's a bit different with the director because they've got certain obligations. So you need to write a get minutes from a board meeting where the directors have voted that director to be furloughed or themselves. You'll presumably do that with your accountant. I think there's most of us as business owners do that anyway. Yeah. Uh, and the agreement needs to very clear, clearly state that. And the third thing you should think about as a director is if you don't want to be the one holding the buck and doing all the work now forever, then have a rotation in place. The, the minimum period for a furlough agreement to be in place has to be three weeks. So you can rotate that every three weeks with another director. Just make sure you've got an agreement clearly showing those periods of time so they can be demonstrated to the HMRC. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to say, not quite directly related to, um, to directors, but it's about holiday. So, so people don't know whether you can, an employer can force an employee to go on holiday, mm -hmm. for example. And the answer is you can as long as you give twice as much notice as the amount of holiday that you want them to take. Yeah. So if you want, if you're insisting on an employee taking a week off, um, uh, then you have to give them at least two weeks notice. And the, uh, the rule is simply, it's only if it's not reasonably practicable, is the legal word, uh, to take that holiday. So if they can't reasonably practically take that holiday, well then it should be just practically, uh, right. then, um, then that, that will be a sufficient reason for them to say no. Okay. And clearly in the current climate, there's no reason they can't take their holiday. I'm sure they'd just rather do it not at home. Yeah. So it's a balancing act again of what the business So I thought that was my question, but I thought I'd mention it. Yeah, thank you. It is, it's a really relevant question. We've been getting a lot of questions around that uh, from our clients as well, just talking about how to manage the holiday because nobody wants everyone to take holiday when we all get back to normal it's going to be an impact but like that, that won't happen because an employer has the right to refuse yeah as much as they have the right to insist yeah. as long as the refusal is reasonable it'd be crazy wouldn't it they can't yeah. you can't just book a holiday without telling you so you yeah. get approval first and that depends on the needs of the business so I, it generally won't be that it will be a case of managing how you do certain things but as i say it's a moot point. It's still, it's still open to the company or employers to decide, well, am I going to insist you're taking holiday employees or not? Otherwise, yeah. the carryover is for two years now. Right, yes. So, it, so if, say, for well, example... A little bit of four weeks, by the way. Only the first four weeks. It yeah. was entitled to 5.6 weeks a year. Pro rata, full-time, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but, but, um, but it's only the first four weeks, a carryover. That could be carried over to the following year. Well, for two years, yeah. So that's this year and next year. Is that what that means? Correct. That, that is that correct. One? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it can be taken over two years instead of one. Correct. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Well, we've got some really nice comments as well. So thank you, everyone. Hopefully, this Q and A sessions format is still very relevant. We are going to be moving the conversation forward for next week. Our next for, uh, next webinar will be Friday the seventeenth. Back to Friday. Uh, yeah. we, we couldn't do this week on a Friday because it's bank holiday tomorrow and but next week it's back on Friday the 17th and again we want what you're looking for from from these sessions um so we're going to be sending out a follow-up link 
that will have a recording of both the original Q&A webinar and also this follow-up session and with a link to the next webinar, which we would love your thoughts on what you'd like. But we are moving the conversation forward to support you in the business continuity challenges that are starting to arise now that we've uh, established where we are in, in, in the current crisis. Look, Misha and I would just like to know, you know, what are your top three nightmares right now? What are the biggest problems you're facing right now? Just tell me your top three. And if you give that in the feedback from the information we're going to be sending you after this, we can actually address things that you want and actually deal with specific headaches that you've got. That's what I'd really love to do for you, uh, for you if anybody's listening. So just, just interact with us. Just give us the information so that we can actually address it for you and that you don't feel like you're alone or not knowing where to look, uh, you know, sitting on the internet all day. Awesome. Fantastic. So that's it from us. Stay safe, everyone. Have fantastic Easter's and we'll see you next Friday at one o'clock, hopefully. And uh, that's a goodbye from both of us. Take care. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Have a great Bye. weekend.